I set out to try and finish P8S, one of the hardest fights in the game with completely random players on the party finder. Little did I realize that the average PF prod can't even count a snake, and I had unbewittingly signed myself up for a complete and utter nightmare. Hi, I'm Cider Spider, and I play Final Fantasy XIV. Because I was able to clear the first three Abyssos raids within the first week of the tier, I was convinced that P8S would be a walk in the park. But it turned out that the park was on fire and all the trees were actually snakes, uh, proverbially speaking. Even though my party finder experience had already set my expectations unfathomably low, I never anticipated just how bad things could get. But what's so bad about P8S that party finder can't handle it? Well, allow me to walk you through it. This isn't a guide, so don't expect to learn every mechanic. I'm only here to share my utter bemusement. So let's get started. Ahem. Hephaistos is real mad. P7S machine broke, and good day bout to be broke too. After an entire three-act circus of markers and positions, you're ready to start a countdown to getting the crap slapped out of you. You shove a whole pizza in your mouth, and the fight begins. First off is a burning ring of fire. Your health goes down, 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 and your rage gets higher. This is a pretty typical raid-wide with one key detail. It's immediately followed up with the most important cast bar in the entire fight. Tetra Flare or Octa Flare. If ever there were a mechanic to BTFO the entirety of Party Finder, it'd be a simple memory check. This is that mechanic. Fisto casts one of two flares, Tetra meaning pair stacks, Octa meaning full party spread. Very easy, right? Of course, but this hits about the time you're three drains deep in a six energy drain opener, reaching for a snack named Celine. So if you suck like I do, you've got a 50-50 chance of being too lost in your buttons to catch the second long cast bar that tells you if it's stack or spread. Now, most raiders would just have someone call this out on voice chat, and even in PF you find the occasional macro chat who dumps the name of the flare in party chat. You can also make a custom text log tab or some crap, but that sounds like about five minutes worth of effort, and I'd rather fail this mechanic a hundred times over than put in that kind of work. And this is an easy mechanic to fail, which is largely due to the next part. You see, when the flare cast finishes, the flare doesn't immediately go out. It's saved for later. Next up, the boss is gonna play frickin' Pictionary on the arena floor with an attack called Volcanic Torches. A bunch of blue lines run across the ground and whatever the doodles in circle gets frickin' exploded. Simultaneously, Snakey Boy hits you with Sunforge, which is gonna summon either a Flaming Bird or a Flaming Noodle, which will burn the hell out of either the outsides or inside of the arena. And now that we're three mechanics deep, everything can resolve all at once. That's right, this is all going off at nearly the same time. All three of these cast bars are essentially one mechanic, and this all happens in the first 30 seconds of the fight. The torches go out first, so you find the two safe rectangles to stand in. Depending on the barbecued animal, you then may or may not have to adjust to not get murdered by a burning square of fire. And then, depending on the original flare cast, you'll either spread or stack with your PF-mandated buddy friend. If you eat the volcanic torch, you die. If you eat the animal fire, you die. If you overlap octa flares, you die. And if you don't stack for tetra flares, well, someone dies and it may or may not be you. And this is the first mechanic. The easy one. Every single mechanic in this fight is a PF wall mechanic. Every. Single. One. Doesn't matter what prog point you're at, you can expect to get memed on literally any phase in this fight. So this first slew of crap salad is served up right before the tank buster rolls out, which is gonna hit the two people at the top of the enmity list with a million billion damage and a bleed effect that does a million billion more damage. So if either of your tanks die on the first set of crap, whomsoever's next in line is gonna get their butt cheeks roasted. GG, idiot. Shouldn't have done so much damage. Another win for casters. But yeah, anyone dying by this point is pretty much a wipe because you haven't even got to the actual first mechanic yet. Reforged Reflection. The bane of phase one, the bane of my entire life. Re. Let's talk about Reforged Reflection. Before we address the elephant in the room, let's address the elephant Titus. See, Reforged Reflection is the cast bar for the transformation mechanic, and there are two different transformations it can choose between, and each one has a slightly different timing, meaning the entire timeline of the fight changes depending on which one it does first. So the two options for transformations are what PF calls snake and dog, or centaur, or legs. Well, if you look closely, it's actually a bear, but whatever. Didn't expect centaur. So we're gonna talk about the non-snake one first. Here's the deal. Hey, Funyuns is hiding something, you see. Under that dirty boy's robe is a secret. He is dense. Uh, homeboy's girdle has been hanging on for dear life, and once that last thread pops, he's about to let it all hang out. 
This tractor's hauling a trailer, and its designated parking space is located approximately square on your forehead. So old boy dips it low, and you better anticipate the knockback or you'll have to pick it up slow. Hephaestos is dummy thick, and the clap of his ass cheeks is about to destroy the guards! So everyone is going to get hit with a cleave, and simultaneously the titanic thunderclap of Thick Man's twerking tirade is going to cause four back-to-back -back raid wides. If your group sucks at mid, which they probably do, then each one of these hits is going to hit like a brick, and your entire team will melt like… something softer than a brick. So we've got raid wides and we've got cleaves, but that's only two things happening at once, and that's just not enough for these newfangled kids with their twick twacks and their smart phones. So while the four attacks are going out, you also need to pay attention to the order that everyone gets hit with cleaves, since each cleave applies a physical vulnerability to two people and they'll time out in the order they're received in. This is important for the next part. See, you've already been twerked on twice, so surely you must have anticipated that you're gonna get twerked on again! That's correct. His hips are about to give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So the boss will now jump four times, and each time he'll target the furthest player from him. In PF, the widely accepted strat for this part is something we call Updog. What's Updog? Nothing much, what's up with you, fam? So he'll jump to the farthest player, thus the first two people that got Vulns run to one corner, and the people with the next two will wait in the center. The remainder of the party will wait at a point adjacent to these two. So each time Homeboy's titanic cheeks touch down, it's gonna do massive damage that has to be shared between two people. If you take the hit solo, you almost certainly die. And if you take more than one hit, you definitely die. So yeah, everyone will swap in and out of the jump spots based on Voln order, and as long as that goes well, you'll all live. Also, this part hits like a dump truck, and I'm not talking about the kind that drives. And that's more or less the entirety of Centaur 1. Oh boy, now it's time for Manifold Flames! It's basically a whole ton of back-to-back -back Sunforge and stack spread mechanics, but it's also where your second burst window happens, and if you're unlucky enough to have Dog 1 in the first Reforged Reflection, your burst will happen DURING all the tight movements meaning your DPS is gonna forget where they are and overlap you with a frickin' Flame Viper. This is practically a non-mechanic with how easy it should be, but PF may surprise you with how many creative ways they can mess it up. So anyways, after all the Flame Vipers and Fire Furries, Kit Fisto is gonna start drawing on the floor again. Except for this set of Volcanic Torches, there's only one safe square, and it's gonna be all the way in one of the four corners. You can find the safe square by simply getting good, and once you're there, you can survive the upcoming raid wide by not sucking. And guess what time it is? Actually, it has always been that time. Furthermore, it always will be. It is and has been time for Snake One. This is also going to start with a Reforged Reflection cast, but this time Das Boss is going to whip out his long, girthy arm and slap you across the face with it. If you stand under him when he transforms, you're getting snake slapped to death. Next, he's gonna cast Gorgo Mantea. And here's where things get pineapple shaped, cause he be passing out debuffs like cheap cigars. Everyone will get one of four combinations, and this is where the fun begins. Old boy is gonna spawn a bunch of snakes, and when they land, they're gonna fire out 360 line of sight petrifies. And if anyone gets hit by it, you're pretty much gonna wipe. So just don't look at them, you friggin' doofuses. Don't look at the snakes. No! Stop looking at the snakes! So you have to do the same thing for every snake. Get it hard, and then get it wet. So the one or two debuffs tell you which set of snakes you need to service, and your second debuff tells you your job. If you have a cone, you'll fire a petrified gaze when the timer ends, and you need to freeze a snake. But because we're in PF, you're going to greet that last weave and freeze your entire party instead. But wait a minute. How does everyone know which snake they need to blow on and harden? Well, PF uses the prio system of G1 and WCCW, G2 and CW, Tanks, Melee's Flex. What the heck does any of that mean? It means someone's gonna mess up the Flex and gaze the party instead. Basically, people in Party 2 will get whatever snake is closest to north moving clockwise. Party 1 will do the same, but from northwest going counterclockwise. But if two people from the same party have the same job, the tanks or melees are the ones who will flex. Like all strats, this one works great when everyone does everything correctly. And also like all strats, Party Finder will frequently mess this up, and then you're gonna disband. So you dodge the petrifies, then petrify the snakes, and then the people with AoEs drop them on the petrified snakes. You do the exact same thing for the second set of snakes. Get it hard, get it wet, get it right, Get it right, get it tight. Anyway, if you don't petrify them first, they'll cast an AoE and murderize you. And if you don't AoE them, they'll unpetrify and murderize you. Technically, you could mess up a snake or two and just mint check the damage, but that's gonna cost you a full party damage down, and that right there is how you fail in rage. And your parents. So anyway, everyone manages to get their snakes right, no one petrifies, no one dies, no one cries. The boss casts Ectothermus. This thermos is haunted AF. But really, it's just another mild raid wide. 
So that's it, right? Snake One Prog complete? Yeah. Now that everyone knows how to do Snake One, you will never fail it again. It's smooth sailing from here on out. Once you pass this prog point, you totally won't ever have any trouble with it in the future. Not in any Phase 1 parties, not in any Phase 2 parties, not in Enrage parties, and not even in Reclear parties. Snake 1 is done. Forever. Totally. So now that all the hard parts are over, we can move on to the even harder parts. It's time for Fourfold Fires. The whole thing starts with another Tetra or Octa cast, which you must remember until the end. Next, Jake the Snake is gonna drop four proximity explosions on the corners of the map, and it's gonna freaking hurt! When the explosions go off, it'll spawn four fire toilets, and now you're ready for Chthonic Vents. Uh, two of the Taco Bell toilets are gonna start bubbling, and I think you know what that means! So everybody runs like hell to gather on the safer, less volatile toilets. Not only do the two toilets then explode, but a couple of silly spaghetti spawn out of them and hop into two different toilets, causing them to explode shortly thereafter. As the second set of toilets blows up, Fisto's gonna cast either Tetra or Octa, meaning you have to either pair stack or full spread within the safe spots, or you're gonna die. So usually PF puts group two on the east of the map and group one west. If both safe spots are on the same side, you'll do this formation, which is called uptime fourfold. Cool kids do big damage, and for big damage, you need big uptime. Just remember, this one is boss relative, so you gotta work your noggin sometimes to make sure you don't end up in the wrong spot, you doofus. Anyway, there's only a stack spread on the second set of explosions, so your positions on the other two is less important. Just make sure you're at the right toilet at the right time for that spicy number two. And as the third explosion goes off, it's time for another Sunforge! More like Funforge, am I right? So this is gonna be another Bacon Snake or Burned Bird, and you remembered the flare cast from before Fourfold Fires, right? Cause it's resolving right now! If you like PKing your teammates, overlap them with Octa Flares. If you like watching them die helplessly, run away when they have Tetra Flare. Cause remember, the boss can't kill them if you do it first. But if everyone lived, it's time for Animals 2! I.e. Reforged Reflection 2. It's like the first one, but not really. Let's start with the dog thing again. This section is deceptively easy, and yet it's probably the place I've seen the most deaths on clear parties other than, you know, the mechanic that shall not be named. Hephaistos is about to do it to you again. Basically, Dog Champ will do four different jumps and all you gotta do is not get stepped on or blown off the map. So, while he transforms, you have a small window to handle the knockback. Then he jumps to the wall. And then the sweat drops down your forehead, cause your brain is doing big things to pay attention for the flare cast, which will mean either light party stacks or pair stacks after the first knockback. And now here comes the fun part. Hephaistopotamus is gonna telegraph four moves back to back, and depending on what they are and where they are, you're gonna plot a course to avoid his preposterous posterior. It'll look something like this. Booty, 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 booty. Rockin' everywhere. So yeah, he'll finish the segment with Volcanic Torches. Very easy. Just don't suck. And now back to your regularly scheduled snakes. Some would say that Snake 2 is easier than Snake 1. They might even be right, but PF will do everything in its power to prove them wrong. PF uses the Spriggan Strat for this mechanic, which should make it super easy. Basically, when Thomas the Snake Engine casts Snake, it's gonna spawn four eyeballs all at once. And them boys are wandering. So everybody goes to their spot and you dodge the snake eyes. Everyone will have both a gaze and a poison debuff, so you can probably see where this is going. When the first gaze debuffs run out, you'll freeze the snake nearest you, so this should result in all snakes being hard. Simultaneously, the first four doses of toilet water get administered, but if you're diligent, you might have noticed there are a few other debuffs hanging around. Cause yeah, this ain't actually like the first snakes. You want to leave them noodly boys high and dry. You have to eat the AoEs all by yourselves, cause his anacondas don't want none. See, if you paid close attention, you might have noticed. Somebody set us up the bomb! Two people have giant AoEs and two people have weird snaky debuffs. The snake debuff is a stack and the AoE is a line of sight explosion that you have to block with... Yep, a snake. And here's where it all falls apart. Two of the remaining snake statues get wiped out by a clone, and immediately everyone has to move into position around the two that are left. PF uses the same priority system here as Snake 1, and the same flex system as well. But because thinking is hard and time isn't valuable, someone's gonna mess up the flex probably every time, and it'll cause you to wipe probably every time. But if you don't wipe, you had better be done with his HP by now, cause if Animal 2 finishes, you've only got one raid wide left before he murderizes you. There's no long dramatic enrage cast here, if you aren't below 50% he just freaking kills you and you go right back to wiping on Snake 1. But if you did get the 49%, Snake Pliskin injects himself with the G-Virus and turns into some kind of big nasty monster, as all gods do. And now we're ready for Phase 2. 
Hephaestos has special eyes, and 1-800-CONTACTS doesn't have his brand, so he's pissed. If you enjoyed dancing around all the setup markers the first time, you're in luck, because there's a ton more you have to do for Phase 2. A bunch of silly ding-dongs got mad about the markers thing in the last video, but probably don't realize that no one in the North American region uses macros for raiding. Maybe the macros are better, maybe they aren't. It doesn't matter because people don't do that here. Thus, I shall reiterate from the previous video. Shut up about macros, I still don't care. So anyway, as with most fights, this one opens with a raid wide and a tank buster. The raid wides have bleed and so do the tank busters. Everything sucks and if your party doesn't mitt, then it'll suck even more. Everyone has mitt, by the way. Every. Single. Class. Yes, DPS, even you. If you aren't coordinating where your mitts are gonna go in the fight, clearing this is gonna be a friggin' struggle. Crap, the macro bros are looking more right all the time. But anyway, moving right along. The first major mechanic is natural alignment. Two people get the purple debuff, which is a constant DOT. Also, if they die, it explodes the entire world and you all wipe. So if any soft targets end up as the NAs, it's a constant babysitting job for the healers. Chad Melees can use Bloodbath here, and I've heard this increases the size of your package, so I'd recommend it. Chad Tanks can slap mitts or heals on the NAs, and this too is known to be package enlarging. So anyway, a set of bars appears over each NA's head. The first one will have a stack and spread marker, and whichever bar fills first is the attack that goes out first. Pretty simple. Also, there's a half-room cleave during the second attack, so don't stand in the bad, you big silly. Next is the fire and ice bars that require you to bait two sets of stack AoEs while avoiding line AoEs that cover 75% of the arena. PF uses the scribe strat for this, which should make the whole thing pretty simple, but every one of these hits hurts a lot and most require flexes. So yeah, expect to get walled here even if the prog point set in rage. Especially if the prog point set in rage. And now that you've burned all your big heals and most of your mitts, it's time for more raid wides and tank busters, woohoo! After that, he's gonna give you some gifts. What kind of gifts? Well, debuffs, of course. I could spend several minutes explaining how this mechanic works, but this isn't a guide, so just don't suck. It's really just stacking, spreading, color matching, and then grabbing towers, but almost any mistakes will blow the entire thing up and you die. Even though this whole thing is super easy and the boss isn't even targetable here, you'd better believe that someone's gonna mess it up 13 out of 15 times and you're gonna disband. Anyway, high concept ends and you go into burst 2. Yay! Next is Limitless Desolation, which sounds extremely intense, but is actually a joke. Basically, everyone gets a Voln, an AoE, and then a tower. In that order. You wait out your Voln, bait your AoE, then get in your tower. Half Istos drops his balls on your head, you barely take any damage, and everybody wins. Extremely easy. Although, because PF is PF, you should be prepared to get memed on this crap anyway. It's actually hard to mess this one up, but believe me, it'll freaking happen, and it'll freaking happen often. Especially in clear parties. And then we move on to Natural Alignment 2. It's pretty much exactly the same as the first one, but this time one or both of the NA people will get a debuff that reverses the casts. If this happens, the meter that fills first will actually cause the opposite attack to happen. In PF, the widely accepted strat is to jump if your bars are reversed. But how can I cast spells if I'm jumping? <laughs> you can't, idiot! But if you don't jump, there's a pretty high chance everyone wipes, so think of this like a personal break you get. Casters just can't stop winning. This is one of the few mechanics this tier with multiple accepted strats. There's NA West, NA Mid, and Static spots. Static and NA Mid are both fine. NA West sucks, and the chance your NA gets silly and forgets they still have to go to the center for fire and ice is pretty high. There's also single tile NA, but if you think PF is pulling that off, you must not have watched the rest of this video. After a bit more filler, we get High Concept 2, and go figure, it's pretty much the same as High Concept 1. There are a few minor differences, but the basic principles apply. The key details are that you need to make a phoenix, and also there are ads that shoot laser beams and kill you. What? So the two people with no debuffs eat the A and combine their genetic material to form Efreets while the first set of towers gets solved. The ads spawn and tether whoever's closest to them and cannot be untethered afterward, meaning you're gonna take too long to get there, miss the tether, and get your whole team killed. Idiot. Ifrits get the east and west ads, and the people who took the first towers will get the north and south ones, and while those four drag the ads away from center, the remaining four people do the remaining four towers, then the two Garadas mix with the two Ifrits to form four Phoenix Feathers, which mix to give everyone a Phoenix buff, and yeah, it's as convoluted as it sounds. However, this is also a surprisingly easy mechanic once you've done it a few times. The real annoying part is that everyone has to get healed to full before Ego Death casts. If your health isn't full, you instantly die, and don't get the Phoenix buff, which gives you double damage for the remainder of the fight. So if any DPS players miss the buff, you probably won't clear. And DPS players sure do love to stand extremely far away so that the AoE heals can't reach them, and then blame everything on the healer anyway. Thank you for party, K-bye. And that just leaves the final mechanic of the fight, Dominion. 
It's pretty simple, but it hits like a truck full of bricks, and I mean the heavy kind. The II Man is going to hit you with a zillion raid wides and two more sets of towers. It's like desolation, but faster and with more raid wides. The only hard part is getting the mitts lined up and getting enough heals out. Generally speaking, if you can get to Dominion, you're ready to clear the fight. I certainly was. For two weeks! And let me tell you, it was painful. If you thought Phase 1 trap parties were bad, I can assure you that Phase 2 trap parties are much worse. But at any rate, after the second set of Dominion, you go to another Ego Death cast, which is the Enrage. Again, the real hard part is getting this far at all. The DPS check these days isn't bad, so if you find a team that can do mechanics, press buttons, and mitigate... Uh, who am I kidding? You're not gonna find that team. The disparity between learning the fight and clearing the fight is massive. You might as well do an any chest party if you haven't cleared by now. Take whatever first clear you can get, because almost every party is a trap party. Just make sure you're actually ready to clear, or you just might be the reason that every party is a trap party. It's hard to put into words the kind of suffering I endured to clear this fight in PF. But let it be known that I sure got that clear eventually. If this video wasn't a million minutes long already, I'd probably reflect on the experience and tell you how it's affected me spiritually. But the really important part is how it's affected me gear ritually. Lol. I got the raid weapon, GG noobs, I stole all the loot and now I'm king of the world until 6.4. One like equals one loot. Okay, bye.